Up next is Dr. D.K. Panda, Professor and University Distinguished Scholar of Computer Science and Engineering at The Ohio State University. Dr. Panda has published over 500 papers in the area of high-end computing and networking. The MBAPH2 libraries designed and developed by his research group are currently being used by more than 3,100 organizations worldwide in 89 countries. More than 815,000 downloads of the software have taken place from the project site. The RDMA packages for Apache Spark, Apache Hadoop, and Memcached together with OSU HIBD benchmarks from this group are also publicly available. Dr. Panda's talk will start with an overview of challenges being faced by the AI community to achieve high-performance deep learning and machine learning on modern HPC systems with both scale-up and scale-out strategies. After that, the talk will focus on a range of solutions being carried out in his group to address these challenges. Welcome, Dr. Panda. You may begin. Uh, thanks, thanks, Brian. Um, thanks to uh, the council uh, for uh, giving me an opportunity to share some of the things uh, what we have been doing. Um, um, it was very nice last year to present this in uh, person, uh, but uh, based on the current circumstances, um, we'll be presenting it remotely. So what I'll be trying to focus on, thanks to Mark and Simon for introducing the background, especially how HPC and AI are evolving. So my focus will be on how do you design the middleware for these kind of exascal systems, not only the dedicated exascal systems, also for the cloud. And uh, this is a uh, sample chart many of you must have seen uh, from the top 500 list. Uh, we have the Fugaku at 415 petaflop. And of course, the community is waiting for the exaclops. There have been a lot of announcements going on. Uh, might be next year, uh, we'll be having an exaclops system at some place in the, in the world. And based on the, the talks given by the previous speakers, so it is very interesting what is happening. This is a very nice um, a cycle which is taking place uh, between these three subdomains, like the high performance computing and then the big data, and then the deep and the machine learning, deep learning and machine learning. So the question is, this kind of convergence is happening from the user's perspective, and there is also an increasing need to run these kind of applications on the cloud. So the challenge is, how do we design the software stack or the middleware so that all these stacks, all these applications can run in a seamless manner on all the modern systems? So when I say this kind of a converse middleware, let me explain what I mean, and then I'll try to provide some solutions later on. So think of like any cluster. We heard about a lot of these uh, clusters being deployed in, in, in UK. So we have a set of compute nodes. These could have accelerators. This could have some resource managers. This can have some parallel file systems. So the broad challenge, most of the systems currently they have is like the MPI jobs running there. Uh, you have uh, different kinds of MPI libraries. Uh, you create modules, and then the users can select any module and run. So can we extend that kind of a framework even to run job or the Spark job or the deep learning job or the machine learning job so that all these can coexist on the same system and even using some simple or a common software stack. And that's what I'll be trying to focus on. So in my group, we have been working on three major projects almost now for 20 years. I'll try to provide you an overview, overview of these. Uh, the MRAPIS project, which is primarily for MPI and PGAS, both for the CPU and GPU. Uh, then we started the HiBD project, which is High Performance Big Data Analytics Library. And finally, also a few years back, we started the High Performance Deep Learning project, uh, trying to target both deep learning as well as machine learning. So I'll try to provide some overview of these and how we are trying to design this converse software stack. And then I'll also try to provide some overview. Gradually, we are trying to deploy our software stacks on the AWS and Azure. We just started a collaboration with Oracle Cloud also and I'll show you some numbers. So let's start purely from the HPC side. As many of you know, MPI has been the de facto standard for many years. Um, your MPI plus OpenMP is very widely used, but then the PGAS, the partition global address space, like OpenSpam, um, UPC, UPC++ have come. So how do you design MPI plus X for exact scale? But of course, inside MPI, if you take a look at the latest MPI, uh, 3.1 standard and then the MPI 4 which is coming, almost there are 400 functions inside this. So you have to actually design this, each one of these functions in the best possible manner so that when the user is trying to activate any of these functions, you get the best performance and scalability. 
So inside that we have of course point to point communication, both internode, internode, two sided RMA, collective communications. But besides just functionality to get the performance, there is also a lot of issues coming up. Like uh, as you know, a lot of nodes are becoming very fat. Like the latest AMD ROM, if you take a look with the dual socket, you have 128 cores, and gradually we'll see in the next few years we'll have almost 1,000 cores per node. So how do you design the stack so that the data goes in and out of the of the node very efficiently? So we need to have some kind of a multiple endpoints per node. Um, with more cores, we are having multiple multi-threading. How we can do integrated support for GPUs and accelerators, for tolerance, quality of service, virtualization, energy awareness. So these are all the kinds of the wishes. So in this context, we started this project. Uh, many of you might be familiar with this. This is the project. Um, we started almost the day one of InfiniBand. Um, when the 2000, the, the um, specification was announced in October 2000, we were almost ready. Earlier to that, we are working on Mirinet, Quadrix, if some of you remember those older uh, technologies. So we were the very first ones in, we started the project and we had the first open source version of our stack in demonstrated at Supercomputing um, 2002. And then since then, of course, we have expanded to all different networks, uh, Omnipath, iWarp, Rocky in the AWS EFA. We have supported all different platforms. So currently, this stack is currently being used by more than 3,100 organizations. In fact, just last week, we crossed um, 900,000, like 0.9 million downloads just from our OSU website. Uh, of course, it is a part of a lot of other software stacks like Red Hat, Suki, OpenHPC stack. Uh, we don't keep track of those. Um, we have also been empowering a lot of top 500 clusters um, over the last 15 years. So this shows the very broad architecture of the stack. We started with the uh, with the purely for MPI for HPC, but gradually I'll show you that we have done very nice integration with all the um, DLML frameworks, and I'll show you the results. So just one MPI library is good enough for you to to handle all the your HPC and AI needs. And we are gradually also trying to bring the big data um, software stacks to that. Um, so inside that, of course, we have this, we support all the different networking technologies. We have all the different uh, kind of platforms. But this middle one is the main thing. This is where we try to bring all our designs. And uh, once we publish these papers in six to nine months, we take it through our software stack. We do a very um, thorough testing. Uh, in fact, within my lab, we have almost 20 servers continuously doing um, uh, quality assurance testing. And when the code is stable, uh, we try to make the release. So there are different versions um, of the libraries. Today, I'll be only focusing on these three. Um, so in this context, let's start with the high performance computing. So we have a basic MHAPIS 2. There is an enhanced version called MHAPIS 2X. And then there is a GPU version, which is MHAPIS 2 GDR. So I'll be talking about those. So of course, I told you about like the, there are almost 400 functions, and we try to make sure that each and every function runs well. But I'll try to show you some of the very latest numbers what we have gone. So as these exascale systems are coming, so think of like a 10 million course. How do you even start an MPI job? That itself is becoming a big issue. And over the years, as the system sizes are growing, we have been continuously making sure that job startup is very good. So here, if you take a look, these are very latest numbers we have taken um, on TAC Frontera. Many of you um, might know like MPI job starts with an MPI in it. So here if you take like a 229,000 uh, processes on 4,000 nodes, we are able to deliver like just in 31 seconds. Half a minute, your job is actually run, running on the system and this is trying to show comparison with other MPI stack like Intel MPI, we can give you a very big um, um, performance gain. Similarly like InfiniBand, some of you might have known there is a hardware multicast. So this is the hardware multicast numbers. If you say like a, this is also taken from the fact Frontera. Um, on a 2000 nodes with a PPN 28, so here you will see like a, this is the software-based team and this is the hardware-based team. So hardware you can see below nine microseconds, we are able to actually send the data. So to all the, all the nodes here, uh, this is for like a small messages. Here if you see the scalability, uh, we are able to even deliver almost like a factor of two um, improvement uh, compared to the uh, the software. And uh, several of you would have heard about the SARP, um, which is the Mellanox has been trying to do in-network computing. 
So in fact, these are the results. I think not many of you have seen this. This is the largest run we have done in the world now on the tax frontier on 7,000 nodes. Um, so here, if you see, this is an MPI already used, PPN1, just a one node, one um, uh, process per node, and see the all reduce. Um, so here, this we have integrated with our MHAPIS 2X. So now you can see compared to the whatever our software solution we had, now we can give you like almost a 5X improvement. Barrier, we can give you a, a, like an 9X improvement. Um, similarly, the reduce, we can give you a 6X improvement. So this paper just has been accepted into the exam MPI workshop to be held in um, um, with SC. So you'll see much more results uh, kind of thing. Similar kind of things we are trying to do uh, hardware tag matching, that is also an in-network computing um, solution. Um, so here again, uh, we are trying to take advantage of the hardware tag matching. This is integrated with the MAPIS to stack, will be available in the upcoming MAPIS to X. Um, so again, here you can see, uh, with the tag matching, we can actually try to uh, deliver better performance like a non-blocking all-to-all uh, by a factor of like 1.7, 1.5x. There is another thing also is happening in the MPI um, uh, uh, forum is something called neighborhood collectives. Um, so depending on your pattern, um, you should be able to optimize it internally uh, very well. So here uh, we just got um, a paper accepted for supercomputing 20. Um, so here you can see like uh, applications like SPMM, NAS, DP, we can give you very significant benefits, like up to 34x speed up or up to 15% improvement. Uh, so, so like this, we are continuously trying to remain on the on the leading edge and trying to bring the very latest from the hardware and trying to put it into the MPI side. So those are on the pure CPU and the networking side. Uh, let me talk about GPUs because a lot of systems we we heard today and also have been been deployed with GPU. So this is a, many of you would have heard of this term, CUDA where MPI library. In fact, this terminology we introduced from our group uh, at ISC, we had a paper 2011 called the CUDA where MPI library. So the broad idea is that if you have a cluster like this, so there is a data from GPU, you want to send data to the other GPU, most of the time people do a CUDA mem copy, do an MPI send, and then do an MPI receive. Some advanced user can do some pipelining, but it takes a lot of effort to get the best performance. So what do we introduce this concept? If you have some data here, and uh, a programmer knows how to write MPI programs using the host buffer, instead of the host buffer, you just put a device buffer on the send side and the receive side, and everything else, see the animation, the MPI library will take care of it, so that the, the user doesn't have to touch CUDA for communication. Of course, for computation, you have to touch, but the communication will be purely handled by uh, MPI, and that leads to very high performance and high productivity. And if you take a look at some of the numbers, so look at this number, 1.85 microseconds. So now we have capability to send actually data from one GPU from a node over InfiniBand to the other GPU just in 1.85 microseconds. So from host to host, currently it is around one microsecond or 900 nanoseconds depending on the MPI library. And with another uh, 900 nanoseconds or 800 nanoseconds, we can actually send data from GPU to GPU. And that gives very big performance gain uh, compared to if, the, if your library is not CUDA aware, you get almost 10x improvement here. Bandwidth-wise, you get 9x and 11x improvement. So that gives a big impact on applications. So this is like a homely blue a molecular dynamics application. Uh, the higher is better. Um, so as you can see, um, instead of uh, like using a regular a library, if you use a CUDA aware library, you can get almost a 2 s improvement. And this is a, our uh, collaboration which we have been doing uh, with uh, Switzerland for the last several years. Um, so if you have been in the Switzerland, if you'll see that actual weather forecasting is coming from our MHPS to GDR library, we have um, collaboration with CHCS and the Meteo Suisse, uh, leading to very uh, nice uh, weather prediction. So that is just some highlights of the MPI project. Um, due to lack of time, I'm just giving some of the highlights. So similar things also we try to do for the big data. Um, as many of you know, like over the years, a lot of software stacks like Hadoop, Spark, HBS, Memcache, Kafka, all they have been um, designed and being used. But the traditional stacks, if you if you take a look, they don't take advantage of a lot of modern networking technologies like the RDMA. So we have actually taken all those software stacks and enabled 
not only the basic RDMA, we have exploited the maximum overlap of computation with communication. So this project is high performance big data, we called it high BD. These are again available for Infiniband, Rocky, uh, all the open power, x86, as well as uh, Singularity and Docker. Um, so what we have done just to give you an insight, like let's say if you take a look at the Hadoop, inside that you have like a MapReduce, HDFS, RPC, so all these components we have enabled to take advantage of RDMA and to provide the best in-memory computing kind of thing. We have also done tight integration with Slurm and PBS. So most of the centers have Slurm and PBS. So just like you submit an MPI job, you can actually submit an Hadoop job. You don't need any additional software stack. And we have also done very tight integration with, with Luster. So, so keeping into the bigger picture, so now what you can do, take our library and then make a module and make it available to your end users. And that's what things have been deployed on uh, San Diego Supercomputing Center Comet, one of our collaborators. Um, so you, just like any other HPC systems, in addition to somebody running an MPI job, you can actually run on the Hadoop job, the common data sheets on the Luster, so you don't need a separate Hadoop cluster kind of thing. Similar things we have done for the Spark. Um, this is like a time to show an RDMA Spark, uh, some performance numbers like the high bench page rank. Um, so it is running on the same InfiniBand uh, FDR cluster here. Uh, the, uh, the orange bar is like using IP over IB, which is the traditional stack, and the red bar is our RDMA enabled stack. So as you can see, we can give you like almost 37%, 43%. The same thing you can do as a this administrator, you can take our RDMA Spark library, configure it properly with depending on your uh, memory requirements or the memory available or the SSDs, uh, whatever you have, and then make it as a module and, and then run it. So, so that is the kind of the convergence uh, what um, uh, we are trying to propose. Then finally, on the high performance uh, deep learning side, here we have again uh, taking a look at both CPU side as well as GPU side. Um, I'll go into a little bit more details. So what we have done recently, um, if you take a look at the stack, some of you might be familiar with Horobot. Uh, that stack actually came from Uber. And uh, now, of course, there are a lot of different modules that are coming uh, or a different uh, middleware. So what we have done, uh, we have done this tight integration of this Horobot or Toss distributed or deep speed to our underlying MPI library. So, so if you are using any of the, let's say, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, and, and any running any application. So in fact, if you just have our basic MAPIS2 or MAPIS2X or MAPIS2GDR library, that's all you need. You don't need anything else. So all these libraries now will be able to, to deliver you the best performance. And I'll try to show some of these numbers here. Um, I'll try to show some basic CPU and GPU based numbers. Then I'll try to show you some um, advanced uh, solutions like out of core training, uh, how we can exploit hybrid parallelism, and I'll show you an use case using AI-driven uh, digital pathology. So this is a distributed TensorFlow we have run on the TAC Frontera. Um, I know many of the people focus on uh, the, the deep learning with GPU, but CPU, as long as you have access to a system, you should be also still be able to take advantage of it. Um, so here, uh, we, we have run our things uh, with the MAPIS 2 x uh, that is optimized for, for CPU side uh, on 2,000 CPU nodes. So it is almost 114,000 cores. It is running and we are getting like a 260,000 images per second. And you can actually, resnet 50, you can train it just seven minutes, okay? So, so if you don't have access to a very highly costly GPU resource, but you have some CPU cluster available, uh, you should be able to still utilize uh, those resources to um, for your DLML jobs. On the GPU side, um, we have been doing a lot of optimized collectives, as you know, most of these deep learning applications uh, depend on a lot of collectives, and one of the most important collective is all reduce. Uh, if you can optimize all reduce, you get the best performance. So these are the MPI libraries traditionally have been doing optimizations for all the different systems, so that is the trend we are carrying out. So here I'm trying to show some numbers compared to DGX2. Um, and many of you know NVIDIA has the library called Nickel2. So see the numbers, like this is our MAPIS2 numbers, and this is the, uh, the green one is the Nickel. So for all the message sizes, like a small to large message sizes, we are able to build the nickel um, in a big manner. These are some of the numbers from the Oak Ridge uh, Summit. Um, that is the number to system, um, similar kind of things here we do. Uh, like for the different message sizes, uh, these experiments we ran on 15 
136 GPUs, uh, both the latency bandwidth were able to get good benefits. Even for large messages, we were able to beat all the nickel solution as well as the other MPI stacks um, on the phone. So those are at the all reduced, but now if we go into the, um, the uh, DL training, so here we had the distributed TensorFlow, again using up to 1536 GPUs. So we took ImageNet 1K, which has 1.2 million images, as you can see, we are able to scale very nicely with getting um, good performance. Um, Nickel was uh, able to not scale beyond these, these no GPUs. And uh, here we are able to train like uh, all the 1.2 million images just in 4.5 minutes. Okay. So as you can see the just using like a, our MWS2 library with the GDR option, so you should be able to get very good performance on all these um, GPU-based systems. So recently we have done a, a lot of studies with the PyTorch because that is getting more um, uh, momentum these days compared to TensorFlow. Um, so here we did some uh, training uh, of the ResNet 50 on 256 uh, Volta GPU. This was run on Livermore Latin system. And again here we try to take all the different options like cost distributed, Horowood, and deep speed. Uh, so these are nickel numbers. These are our MWAPIS2 numbers as you can see. Almost we are able to get or deliver almost 10,000 images per second faster compared to uh, the nickel library based solution. So those are some of the, sim the initial numbers. Uh, as many of you know these days, as the model sizes are becoming larger and larger, the problem is becoming called out of code thing. So if I cannot feed the model and and the image inside the GPU or CPU memory, how I can do it using the traditional data parallelism mode. So this is where we have been focusing a lot on the model parallelism. Uh, so the model parallelism can actually work out of core models, but there is a big challenge. How do you do the model partitioning? How how do you distribute the tasks? So we published a paper um, at ISC uh, this year, and and uh, we have taken that, and now actually there are some more results in that paper. But here I'll show you a very concrete example. Uh, we have been working with uh, the pathologist at the Ohio State University. A typical pathologist, when you go to a doctor, like you give and the pathologist take a look at it. Everything is moving to so here if you see pathology whole slide image, each whole slide image is like 100,000 to 100,000 pixels. You cannot fit in the single GPU memory. Um, so the, we worked with them. So these people were trying to train based on all their samples they have, even using one GPU, it was taking them 32 hours. And that is not a practical. If you somebody tells you these days like you take 32 hours for training, they are not able to go for a complex model. So we worked with them very closely, even very simple things, uh, uh, scale up. Uh, we, on the same node, we are able to reduce that to 7.25 hours using four GPUs, and then we did the scale out. So now we have given them a solution like just 27 minutes. They can actually scale. So now they are actually um, very uh, anxious to, to go into very complex models and then trying to see how they can actually do a lot of these uh, uh, feature extractions um, very efficiently using the deep learning. So this paper. Uh, will be presented at supercomputing um, uh, next month, and you will see more more details. The similar kind of things we are also taking to look at the data science. Um, some of you might be familiar. Dask is is uh, becoming an important middleware in that context. Currently, it has support with UCX. So here we have taken like an MPI for Dask. We have introduced an MPI for Pi, and we have linked into MRPs to GDR. So now, if you take a look at some of the numbers, these are some sample numbers. Um, we just had a paper accepted, will be presented at IPC20. Um, so this is the IP over IB number, this is the UCX number, and look at their MPI numbers. We're able to give you benefits. If you run with MPI library, the DAS applications, you get benefits like a 3.47x, 6.9.2x better. Similar approach also we are using uh, uh, the community which is emerging in the machine learning is the QML. Um, so they have the different, uh, like a multi-node, multi-GPU setting so that you can actually scale. Um, so here again, um, currently it has UCX and Nickel support, but we have done the tight integration uh, with our mapis to GDR. And now if you take a look at some of the numbers, like these are the k-means, nearest neighbors, um, linear regression, and truncated SVD, we are able to give almost like a 1.6, 1.4 speed up. So this again, 
the paper just got accepted into MLHPC workshop, so will be presented at in conjunction with the supercomputing, and so you will see much more results here. So all together, so what we are trying to lead to, again, bring into this converged middleware principle that you can take the same MPI library, whatever you were using for the HPC, now you can actually try to utilize for all your deep machine learning jobs, and you don't need any other software stack or, or uh, library uh, to have your jobs done. So, so these are all for the dedicated system. So gradually we are trying to uh, push our solutions to the cloud. I'll, we have been working with both AWS and Azure. Uh, if you take a look at the Azure, uh, some of you know they directly use InfiniBand with virtualization. Um, so our solution have actually been integrated. Uh, so if you have an Azure account, you get these images uh, directly. Um, as we make the release, in few months we try to work with them and then push it there. Uh, take a look at some of the numbers here. Um, so this is a WRF with MHPS2. We are comparing with MHPS2X. Uh, that is our advanced version has XP main support. That is a funnel based module. So now you can see we are able to scale better um, in, in their systems. Um, on the AWS side, as I indicated uh, earlier, they have a specialized adapter called EFA, Elastic Fabric Adapter. It's not InfiniBand, but we have an MHPS2X version for that EFA adapter. So we have been making releases. We just made a release. Um, just a few weeks back here. Um, here again, there are uh, currently supports are currently available for their basic OS types. And if you take a look at the same WRF application, um, here we are comparing on the AWS HPC instances between OpenMPI, Intel MPI, and our MAPIS 2X version. So now you can see the MAPIS 2X versions delivers far better performance and scalability compared to the other stack. So, so if you have any of these uh, cloud uh, Accounts, we should be able to also try to now utilize our solution not only on dedicated clusters but also on the cloud. And as I indicated earlier, we've just got a, a new funding from Oracle Cloud. Um, so we have just started working with them. So very soon you will see um, our solution will also be available on the Oracle Cloud. So before winding up, I just also want to indicate uh, we have been not only pushing from the OSU side on the research front, um, we also have a commercial spin up. Uh, a lot of Organizations are actually looking for commercial support of our solutions, uh, the MAPIS2 and HiBD and HiDL libraries. Uh, we are currently working with national laboratories and uh, international supercomputing centers. Um, and, and in addition to providing the commercial support and working with end users, we are also providing some value added products. Um, so very soon you will be seeing, we had some presentation here, like we have two packages, XCAL HPC package, um, takes a lot of our solutions, which are publicly available from the OSU side, but does very fine tuning, easier installation. And most importantly, currently we are working um, on the Bluefield adapter, which has an ARM based smart NIC. Um, so we have actually a very nice solution where MPI communication has been offloaded. Um, some of the initial results were presented at the MRPC user group meeting. Um, uh, some more solutions are coming, so there will be a newer product which will be coming out which will try to overlap your computation and communication using the, uh, the ARM processors at the smart. We also have another XL AI product uh, coming there. This is based on the MAPIS2 GDR and the integration I showed here. But the focus here is to help users to extract more performance. So we have a very new capability for deep introspect. Because many times you learn your deep learning jobs, you don't know where you are losing the performance. So it has a very nice visualization interface and through that interface, you can exactly find out, oh, look, at this place, these are the large messages are being used, and this is where the contention happened, or this is where you are losing performance. So it will help the end users. It will also help the system administrators to enhance the ecosystems uh, for deep learning uh, so that the end users can actually get the best performance. So with this, let me conclude my talk here. Um, as I started the talk, and we are also hearing even in this event, um, the upcoming exascal systems and cloud uh, need to be designed with a holistic view of uh, not only the traditional HPC, but the big data and also deep learning and machine learning. I presented some of these overview here, some of the solutions. And uh, as we head into exascal and Zscal systems, uh, we need to have this kind of a continuous innovation in designing the converged software architecture um, so that using a few software stacks, people should be able to actually take advantage of all these uh, uh, different domains, and that will lead to very high productivity, um, and it will benefit the science. So with this, let me um, 
thank all the, our sponsors uh, not only like the uh, the we uh, the funded as well as the equipment support provided by a lot of organizations but more importantly these are all my heroes uh, past and current students and staff uh, um, so as i indicated this uh, projects have been running for 20 years a lot of these students and staff have come contributed to the projects and have gone so i'd like to really acknowledge each one of them every time i i give a talk so with this let me conclude here um, uh, if there are any quick questions i'll be happy to answer um, otherwise you can also send me follow up questions to my email and uh, i'll be happy to answer those also thank you